Good morning, and please be seated. May the grace of God fill us and open us to his word. Jesus is on his opening tour. He hasn't preached much yet, according to Luke, or done much healing. Jesus has just come from the wilderness where he was led by the Holy Spirit following his baptism. So rather than introduce us first to his warm-up act, John the Baptist, as do the Gospels of Mark and Matthew, the Gospel of Luke begins its account of the beginning of Jesus' public ministry with Jesus' return to his hometown. We get Jesus fresh in his public calling, preaching in Nazareth to his mother, to his siblings, and all the people who knew him when he was growing up. And though Jesus is young and experienced at this point, he is wise in the ways of the human condition and in the call of God. He is a prophet, and like his mother Mary and his cousins Elizabeth and John before him, he is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Before Jesus' birth, the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, and the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Months later, Mary speaks prophetically to Elizabeth. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And so now the time has come, and the Holy Spirit comes to Jesus at his baptism in the River Jordan, and then it drives him out into the wilderness to face evil. And in the wilderness, Satan tests Jesus with doubt, fear, and desire. And yet the darkness does not overcome him. It is with wisdom born of both the Holy Spirit and of wrestling with temptation that Jesus now enters his hometown of Nazareth. So Jesus comes to tell us who we are and who we might become, what we might become. After his experiences, Jesus knows the power of the temptations that surround us and the power of God to help us overcome them. On this Sabbath, he teaches in the synagogue laying out the purpose of his ministry here on earth. He quotes Isaiah the prophet, who spoke to the ragged masses of Israelites returning to Jerusalem from captivity in Babylon. Isaiah brings them good news, as Jesus brings good news to the people of Nazareth, and as he brings good news to us here at St. Margaret's. He says, God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. This is Jesus' mission, his ministry, his marching orders. And his message, the wisdom that he brings to us, boils down to this, that each one of us is loved completely and entirely by God. If we forget the centrality of that Christian truth, we are the poor, the poor in spirit. If in our desire for new things, for power, for the good opinion of others, we ransom God's love, if we seek the dark seeds of evil that Satan offered Jesus in the desert, then we lose everything. We lose our very selves because we forget what it is that God desires for us. God's desire is that we feel in our very hearts 
God's tenderness and compassion for us and for all our siblings. Jesus, in his wisdom, has brought good news to us, the poor and the poor in spirit. Wisdom is the knowledge we are held by God. When wisdom directs us, all our choices in life move from that knowing. Our sacred ground groups this week, or, or actually over the past few weeks, are discussing the book Jesus and the Disinherited. The theologian, civil rights leader, and mystic Howard Thurman writes about being grounded by his grandmother's wisdom and by her assurance of God's love for her. And it's a very moving passage in Thurman's, in Thurman's book. He describes his grandmother who, though born into slavery and so stripped of all personal identity and power, finds God living in her. And so the awareness of being a child of God feeds us as it did Howard Thurman, as it did his grandmother, and as it did the young Virgin Mary. And it feeds us with new courage, fearlessness, and power. When the great fashion editor, Andre Leon Talley, died earlier this week, a friend of mine commented, there was a man who stood inside himself. You could see it in his bearing, in the way he carried himself through the world. To stand inside yourself is to know that you are loved by God and that it is God who stands inside you. And Tally also, like Thurman, spoke of the way his grandmother taught him this. When we know this, we are free to face, we are free to question the social values and actions that harm our neighbors. If we are captive to false visions of ourselves, we are blind to the beauty of God that lives within our neighbors. The poor abused as well as our enemies. But when we accept God's vision for us, that we are each a child of God, then we can feel profoundly the power of the Holy Spirit. Just as Howard Thurman did, as his grandmother did, and as I might guess that Tally did, we are no longer blinded. We can come together as the people of God to help free all the oppressed. I learned about standing inside myself as a child from a man named Bart Kennedy. Who, Bart Kennedy was a friend of my parents. And many weekends, we drove out to what we called Bart's farm. Bart didn't know anything much about farming, but he determined to give up his life in the city and the good opinion of many of his friends and make a go of returning this old piece of land, this farm, to life. So one time, he and my father stood outside by a pen, and I climbed up on the split rail fence to listen. And Bart said to my father, I try to make at least 10 mistakes a day. This was an astonishing idea to me a child bred to achieve and avoid mistakes at all costs. But Bart said, if I can't be with looking like a fool, I'll never learn how to farm this land. He said, I need to be good with who I am. And so, taking him quite literally, I followed Bart all around the farm, seeing what mistakes he was going to make. I was in love with the idea that an adult could be willing to look like a fool. I determined I wanted to be that kind of fool, too. Never afraid to be wrong, to ask the questions that I don't know for answers I don't have. But it took me decades of making mistakes and picking myself up 
before I realized that it was the power of the Holy Spirit that gave me the freedom to keep on trying, that gave me the power to say, I'm going to make 10 mistakes today. And feeling God's love anchored me in that. In the epistle today, Paul explains to a startup church in Corinth, the Holy Spirit, that very same Holy Spirit lives in each one of us. Each one of us, Jew or Greek, white or black, slave or free, greedy or humble, has been baptized as a child of God. Not one of us is loved more. Not the CEO of Exxon nor the clerk at CVS. Neither the wise Buddhist monk, Thich Nhat, Nhat Han, who just died yesterday, nor your loud, hot, rotting neighbor has greater access to God. Each of us is a hand or a foot, an ear or a toe of the body of Christ. Without any one part, the whole is incomplete. And that is because the whole, the whole exists within each of us. God has so arranged the body, says Paul, that the members have the same care for one another. When one piece of us, when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. If any one of us cannot walk safely down the streets, if any one of us cannot afford to pay our rent, if any one of us is not free to vote, our shared body suffers a blow that reverberates among all of us. God freely gives us grace, love, compassion. And so I ask us to open ourselves to these gifts, these gifts given freely to us by God, and to appreciate how the love of God contains us and holds us and gives us the help we need to stand inside ourselves with that love. And if this sounds impossible to you, or too abstract, then be concrete and ask yourself, how many mistakes will I make today? How can I wake up and feel the Spirit of God is in me? Because that will then allow you to come together with all of us as we turn to the work that is set for us as Christians to help bring good news to the poor and to help the oppressed go free. Amen.